Good afternoon, everyone from uh, New York that is slowly coming to life, uh, um, slowly uh, starting um, what everybody calls uh, a new reality, whatever that may uh, mean. We are continuing our um, online program with a new edition of the Leon Ferraro conference series. Uh, that is uh, highlighting topics um, relevant on both sides of the Atlantic. And we are very excited to uh, have as guests uh, one of the best known Romanian um, writers uh, in the world, um, Petru Popescu, um, poet, novelist, screenwriter, uh, director, producer, uh, a man who can uh, safely say that um, has made it in Bucharest and in Tinseltown, which is, of course, uh, difficult in both uh, cities. Uh, Petru Popescu, uh, thank you uh, for accepting our invitation. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's very nice to be with you. And I accept it with great ease. <laughs> and actually, almost with a little feeling saying, finally, at last. They're having me. Uh, I am very excited that uh, despite the times that we're all living, um, people who know my writing and people who, Romanian Americans who may not know it, but may uh, start looking for it from now on, are present with you. So it's a very special occasion for me. I thank you. And I'm open to your question. Um, of course, you have um, you have a huge uh, fan base. Uh, a lot of people in Romania and in the United States know you, know your biography. Of course, have um, have read you. But I think it's my uh, duty uh, for those who may not uh, know uh, much about you to just uh, give uh, them a glimpse about your uh, biography, about the long list of uh, of books. Uh, many of them um, huge uh, uh, successes you've written in, uh, in a long and very successful uh, career. So um, Petru Popescu studied um, English uh, literature and language at the University of uh, Bucharest, continued his uh, studies in uh, Vienna, Austria on a Herder scholarship, um, was part of the famous um, International writing, uh, Writers Program at the uh, University of Iowa, uh, and also graduated directing at the American Film Institute. He um, was a very successful writer from a very early age. Um, he uh, debuted with a poetry book. Uh, I would say, uh, looking back uh, to this uh, fantastic career, aptly uh, called uh, a god uh, between uh, city blocks, uh, but of course it became hugely, insanely famous with, um, uh, with a novel, Entrapped, followed by other very successful books. Uh, of course, the iconic cult book, uh, Honey Sweet is uh, Homla Homeland's uh, Bullet, uh, but also uh, the burial of the vine, uh, God's uh, children. They all uh, were published in Romania and some of them in translation uh, throughout the world and made um, uh, Petru Popescu a young author uh, in his uh, 20s, uh, late, uh, late tw uh, 20s, uh, one of the um, best sold and admired um, writer in Romania, indeed the writer of, um, of a generation. Uh, the generation of, um, let's say, 1968 uh, in Romania, the first generation that was um, uh, raised during the communist dictatorship, but all, was also longing for a different life, was urbane, was uh, uh, living in cities, was well-educated and found in this amazing writer, the writer that they had always um, um, expected. Uh, in uh, 1974, uh, he uh, defected uh, first in the, um, uh, in the United Kingdom, later moved uh, to the United States, and after a couple of years, uh, resumed this uh, amazing career, became 
uh, indeed one of the best uh, known Romanian uh, names on the international literary uh, scene. Um, a, a, a string of uh, literary successes uh, followed. Here are a couple of uh, books that um, really made a, made a big impact. Um, some of them just a couple of titles, The Last Wave, uh, Before and After Edith, In Hot Blood, um, Amazon uh, Beaming. Uh, this is a very important book. It was made into a very successful um, a theatrical uh, show uh, starring um, UK uh, thespian uh, Simon McBurney, uh, The Encounter, uh, also almost uh, Adam, and probably the most successful in terms of uh, circulation, almost one million uh, copies sold, uh, but also The Return, The Oasis, um, Girl Mary, uh, the Were Girls. Uh, it's a quite a long, uh, long list of books that have um, uh, have um, had a, an extraordinary uh, circulation uh, and uh, and um, created a, a reputation for uh, quality fiction uh, writing and for uh, exciting um, exciting prose um, writing. Um, uh, Petru Popescu uh, has not only been a, um, a writer, he has uh, uh, written several screenwriters for television and for the big screen, uh, but also directed uh, two, um, two films. Uh, one is Death of an Angel uh, in the 80s, working with the major studios and major A-list uh, uh, actors uh, and also Nobody's uh, Children, co-directed with um, his wife, uh, Iris Friedman, also a uh, filmmaker. Uh, so after this uh, bio, of course, I could have said, uh, I could have said much more. Um, Petru Popescu, thank you again for being uh, for being uh, in, in this program. Thank you for sharing this, um, uh, this uh, uh, afternoon. I know it's still morning in uh, or late uh, late morning in uh, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, I would start. Um, of course, we are um, uh, we are facing uh, one of the, mm, the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, medical crisis uh, in a century. Um, a, a crisis that is. Um, probably followed by uh, social, economic, political uh, crisis. Um, it is um, a very, uh, very um, uh, interesting time, I should say. But I, would, I wonder, um, what, does it, what do you make of this time? How do you, how do you, um, how do you read this uh, time as an artist? As a, as a writer? Is it uh, a time of discovery? Is it a time of, um, uh, of change? Is it a passing nuisance that uh, everybody is bored with? Um, how do you see it as a, as a person and as an artist? Is it, uh, does it influence your, um, your uh, writing or your themes or your subjects? Oh, I uh, will have, I, I'd like to confess first that this is not my first uh, pandemic. I was, um, I had a twin brother back in Romania who died of a pandemic that Romania suffered in 1957. That was a polio epidemic. And uh, my twin brother was uh, one of the victims. And not only that, but since uh, the, the extent of the pandemic then as now, in that small country as in today's giant country that we live in, the extent of the pandemic was first not known, then it was obfuscated by bureaucrats, then it was confused with other possible diseases, and in the meantime, the acquisition of a vaccine, there was a vaccine then against the polio already, the salt vaccine from the United States, but the buying of the vaccine was delayed and delayed, and uh, uh, the communist state being generally a state that glorified itself all the time and did not want to give out any impression of weakness or failure or suffering. So with all of those things together, 
I suffered at that age. All the feelings that I see now in the newspapers and on TV and whatever people are experiencing them for the first time and they're learning that there is a kind of exceptionally sad and exceptionally lasting, unfortunately, type of crisis that our planet can have. And even though a lot of other things could happen, I mean, there would be climate change can surprise us in many ways, and it can also surprise us in many tragic ways. Um, there is a relationship between us and the notion that the planet could be the attention of another civilization. There is, what can I say? We are um, not only the United States, the whole world right now. We're a culture of great imagination. We imagine things, we imagine great dangers. This one, the pandemic that we live now is not an invented danger. It is a danger that's real. It uh, ends lives in every day. So it's very sad. It does something I think that is perhaps very valuable. It makes a lot of people think inside internally about how they lived so far and how they would like to live from now on. I mean, life is precious, our own first, everybody's also right after that. I'm advantaged in a certain way. First of all, I work in my own office in a, um, in a little construction behind my house in Beverly Hills, California. Therefore, I don't have to go to work. I don't have to punch the clock. I don't have to deal with commuting. I can be as active as I always was. On the other hand, uh, I miss society greatly. I miss my children who uh, the young Popescus, let me introduce them right now briefly. My daughter, Chloe Popescu, is an agent at one of the largest talent and business agencies in Los Angeles at United Talent Agency. And my son, Adam Popescu, is a young published novelist. He would be the third writer in the line of Popescus in my time. And he is also a uh, frequently published reporter if you, look, if, you, if you look for the, the name Adam Popescu with the New York Times alone, he publishes in others as well. You'll find them often. Um, anyway, like we said, it's a time of reflection. Loneliness helps us see our mistakes. Loneliness makes us a lot more forgiving for others. Loneliness gives us a possibility to imagine the future different from the point of view of how we will behave. All those things are positive. The danger, unfortunately, isn't. And the inescapable, perhaps, um, mistakes that leaderships make when they are uh, faced with a big uh, national tragedy, those are deplorable, even though in a certain sense they're understandable. Um, I would like to wish with this occasion all the good health possible and all the uh, remaining capacity for every one of us to enjoy our lives and to try to be happy in the midst of so much tension. Definitely we will uh, be much happier if we, um, if we read your books. And, uh, and I'm sure that for uh, many in isolation and social distancing and lockdown, uh, some of your titles have been quite uh, a reassuring uh, companion. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the theme of our uh, conversation is um, literary success, uh, cinematic success, Hollywood, fame, um, writing uh, stories that are meaningful for, for a, wide, uh, a wide readership. And I will start by um, asking you, uh, I'm starting from an observation that not all um, uh, novelists or prose writers uh, have made a successful transition to writing for the screen. And uh, Scott Fitzgerald may be the case in uh, the best case in, in point. Uh, what do you think uh, some of the, the writers uh, are not able to successfully make this uh, transition from, let's say, novel to screenwriting? Mm. Um, it's a good question. It's a question with a long answer, a long and complex answer. 
but I saw in the, you, you, you were kind enough to send me the questions before, so I, I somewhat prepared Don't the Don't reveal too much uh, about the... <laughs> extremely, you're an extremely um, welcoming host so far. I'm, I'm sure you will be till the end of this. <laughs> but you are giving an, as, as an example, Scott Fitzgerald. And Scott Fitzgerald tried with the movies, as I tried with the movies, our conditions, our circumstances, respectively, could not have been more different. Scott Fitzgerald was a deservedly well-known writer at the time that he had started to have an interaction with Hollywood. And I was an, a much less known international. I was known as a young, hard-headed, sort of dissident visualist, um, sensational in a certain way, interested in lives and interested in sexuality and all those themes that um, the very conservative um, communist regimes were trying to stifle and manage for a very long time. But I did not have a base in English yet. I started to write in English, believe it or not, at the age of 32. Before 32, I had never composed a literary sentence in English even though my knowledge of English was real and I had been influenced and uh, puzzled at the same time by some great American writers. From the point of view of writing, I started with a gamble that was really scary. I had no idea if I would be successful. There are many people who are enormously intelligent and they do not express themselves in any other language, but they're all. It is a fact. You have to have a kind of linguistic intelligence, so to speak, which I'm happy to say Romanians often have. Finally, at, at um, a long delayed advantage from the fact that Romania has been occupied and forced into the orbit of other uh, cultures and other empires. And at the same time, that extremely small nation, it's small now as it always was, showed an incredible survival appetite and adaptation of faculty. And one of them is, of course, Romanians speak foreign languages, write foreign languages. A friend of my father's from college, Eugen Ionescu, Eugen Ionescu whom I met, was one of the first internationally um, known Romanians that I sat at the same table with, spoke, wrote French, not only like a Frenchman, but better. and. Uh, Cases like that, there were a number of them, not all of them were writers. Jean Negulescu, who was a Romanian uh, director of great repute in his time, spoke fabulously well, four or five languages. I had to start at the bottom. I could not convince people simply by talking about myself that I was an, an interesting and potentially important writer. What could I write in English that was easier than fiction in the beginning? would have been only screenplays. So basically, Direction Hollywood was a necessity. And um, I was, I had scratched together enough money to um, pay for my tuition at the American Film Institute. I did go to the directing class, not the writing class. From an, I mean, I had an inside feeling, forgive, uh, um, forgive arrogance, that I thought to myself, well, writing, at least I don't have to learn. I have to learn a new, a new language to write in, but writing itself, I don't. Necessity forces you to be um, ingenious, and it imposes on you for a while a very interesting form of modesty that Scott Fitzgerald did not have to have about himself. Scott Fitzgerald realized, in my opinion, as far as I know about his class, what a lot of other great writers realized, that if they go to Hollywood as workers in the writing sphere, they will be a second or third generation of intellectual respect, and that before that would be the directors, some of the actors and stars, many of the producers. The relationship between Hollywood and writers is not inimical. Many people have had beautiful careers, but it is tough as hell. It is competitive. You almost never know where you are, what they think about you, what they prepared that they could hand to you. The case of myself and uh, Simon McBurney is so unusual. Simon McBurney told me that he read about 
20 years ago, probably 25, maybe, um, almost that. Uh, sorry, Amazon Beaming. Amazon Beaming. He read Amazon Beaming and he liked it very much. And he started thinking if it could perhaps be turned into a stage play, which it didn't seem to, to be an easy material for a stage play. We're discussing a, a book that is, um, has as main character an explorer. This explorer goes to Amazonia, flies small planes, uh, meets Indian tribes that have never been contacted. His eye to eye uh, moves a lot with the Amazon. Lauren McIntyre was a sort of scientific Tarzan of his own career. So how do, you, how do you translate that into a play? That, Simon McBurney told me, made him be very slow in, in the, the way he thought about could it become a play and how. The acquisition of the material for me took two decades. In other words, two decades after I published um, Amazon Beaming, a director about whom I knew, and I knew also his list of dramatizations, it was long, it was full of great names and all of that, totally intimidating. Finally, we were face to face and he said, I would like to, to buy the material to turn it into a play. And I said, how would you turn into a play something that's sort of as big as the Amazon, as noisy, as full of storms, as full of characters, as whatever, and controversial to an extent and all of that. The book had been translated in, eight or nine languages. Um, he, he said, well, I'm, I'm seeking the formula. He saw the formula at the end. He had this inspiration about the binaural rendering of the plot and the characters of Amazon Beaming. And uh, uh, I was, I went, I saw it cold at the uh, theater festival in Edinburgh. I was knocked on my back. I could not believe what one man on stage could do. And I was at the same time reminded of the fact that in my valuation, it doesn't mean that I dislike writing screenplays. I like them. They have to be clever. Sometimes I manage to be clever enough. I like the society of producers and actors, even though the hand down is always one down from the producer, from the star, from the director to the writer. The writer is never at the top unless he is the kind of writer that like James Patterson uh, turns out a multi-million dollar making thing every two or three years and he doesn't need anybody. Scott Fitzgerald did not need them. I did. <laughs> until, the, until the relationship uh, stopped being as modest as the first two or three years, I started to co-write, I started to write, I had name, my name on screenplays and on the screen on the produced movies, I acquired a certain type of notoriety. At the same time, and through my last experience, which was one of writing and directing fully a feature film that was co-produced by Robert Redford, that was um, released by 20th Century Fox, that had really interesting actors in it, Death of an Angel, and I knew finishing it and editing it that I would never be as good as a director as I will always be as a novelist or as a writer of nonfiction. You, you didn't I, like the process? You, you, you thought the process was, was too grueling? The process was, the process was fat, fascinating. It, was a, it wasn't at all intimate. When mm -hmm. you're a writer, I mean, you can do anything you want. You can exhibit yourself naked and do acts of total um, scandalous provocation. Which you place. never do, of course. <laughs> of course I, do it. I write exactly for those high points of the fiction, which are, sh let me show you my nakedness as a soul, as a mind, and maybe even my physique a little bit. But what I'm trying to say is, is that while I have in writing a great, a, a great, I have an unusual ability to be able to be visual and dramatic. And that I had from the beginning for my first pieces in Romania which is the thing that actually so took by surprise the Romanian censorship that I slipped through. And as you said, the, the success was, was, it was quick, it was immediate. And because of that, the literature seemed to become um, the literature of the young. This was a, a writer, a poet, and a novelist of the young. That's right. that, 
impressed even the communist institutions. The young were great unknown at the same time desired political section in a society like the one of communist Romania. I came with it and they came with me. I, I'm not going to say that I had a privilege. I did not have a privilege. Uh, life in between the publications. Almost every book of fiction of mine was published with 40, 50 pages torn out at the censorship and I had to replace them. I did negotiations. At, like everybody else at the time. Right. Towards the end, I have to say that I, I learned some of my own maneuvers. For instance, I knew that if I stick in a sort of very crudely sexual moment about halfway of the book, will be all the attention of the censorship goes to that and how to take it out, at least to tame it. So a lot of the statements that were political and a lot of the intimate um, confessions of the writer, which was sad. I was from a family that was very patriotic, very old in Bucharest. We had suffered. My father was a left winger who nonetheless tasted the communist jail. So I thought the world of my family and uh, I thought it was terrible that that part of the Romanian intelligentsia that represented patriotism and history and uh, national dignity and learning and whatever you will. They were in the toughest spot that history, even under the Turks, I don't think that they had been so humiliated and so controlled. I managed to start escaping that control. I created my formula and um, at least for two or three years, like I said, in between the face-offs with the uh, censorship, when I had to, to, I was with my heart pounding, which pages, which chapters, which things will not be allowed. And those will have to go out and I'll have to come back with something somehow in, equally interesting and equally strong. I did, I did benefit from, uh, I think you should interrupt me because yeah. <laughs> I'm going on. <laughs> now, now I, I, look, now I realize, you know, now, oh yeah, I have a writer in this program and you know, writers are, you know, are making, no, but it's, it's a fascinating story. Ended, yes. It's a fascinating story and in, indeed it's, um, it was very, it was very important. I've, um, while preparing for this uh, conversation, I've read, uh, several of your interviews uh, in which you describe in very, very uh, detailed uh, terms um, how um, humiliated we were, how annoyed you were with this, um, this uh, continuous fight with, uh, with the censorship. But of course, the, com our conversation is about, uh, not only about your career, uh, amazing career in uh, in Romania but also um, what what happened after you you left um, Romania and of course uh, um, making it in uh, in uh, in Hollywood and uh, and also um, uh, bursting on the literary uh, literary stage with uh, you know with these books and this circulation uh, and um, what, what what do you think I mean of course, everybody, uh, um, critics, saw the cinematic quality in your Romanian books, you know, after the debut, you know, they, they were, they were uh, fantastic novels, but at the same time, you could have read them as films, you know, you could have easily, um, easily uh, translate them and then sort of in your mind. Uh, on uh, on the screen, and also you worked as a screenwriter in Romania as well. Uh, um, uh, going back to what makes um, a good story for the film, do you think that because you, your stories are always very um, very interesting, you know, your books are page turners. You know, you want to learn more about the characters, the situations. They are, uh, you know, I mean, you just uh, you just. Uh, you, you, you can't, uh, you know, leave, leave them, um, some have forgot them on a shelf and so on. you got to finish them. And it's always been like this. I grew up with your, uh, with your books. I'm 
uh, I think you, you can tell I'm a huge fan. <laughs> uh, yes, I, know, yes. I know your books uh, inside inside out. My my mother and my family uh, loved your books, and I know all her generation really really um, uh, read you know your books with almost you know the, this re religious uh, religious joy you know finding their right. They were. They were in the cities, they were university educated, they were young, you know, they felt as your characters, they were vital, they wanted to do something, they were polyglot, right, they spoke uh, languages. All these characters that you have, um, you have so well, um, so well created and it's, it's like a trademark in literature, but uh, go, coming back to, uh, to Hollywood and to storytelling, you've always been uh, a, um, a, uh, a very good storyteller, the way you pick the stories, the way you told the stories. Tell us a, a bit about this quality that helped you as a novelist and as a screenwriter. Well, this is, uh, first of all, storytelling is it. It is like the beginning and end and occasion and sometimes the end all and be all of both film and fiction. So I'm glad that you are uh, fastening in on that because it is the thing that advantaged me from the beginning. And at the same time, I get to verify every day that the story is, if a story is not strong enough, meaning that it doesn't, um, that it doesn't challenge me, the writer enough, that it doesn't amuse me, that it doesn't interest me, that it doesn't motivate me, that it doesn't, if a story puts me in a state of emotion about that possible fateful uh, happening in the life of the characters, then it's not a good story. And I've had like all writers, weaker things that either I abandoned halfway or after I had finished them and I reread them, I said, this is not by me. This is who knows who this other writer is, but I am a writer who is so, how shall I say, so dedicated to his characters and that my characters show the same dedication towards their lives. That's what, how I have to, <clears throat> that's how I have to, to write. And the chances of those books being at least interesting, being at least gripping, even if they present uh, premises that are questionable. I mean, all writers have, if you're not a writer who is both, um, if you're not provocative and even more than provocative, if, you, if you're not somewhat scandalous from the point of view of established ha habits in the readers, then you're not a writer that participates in the progress of literature or film. The, the pushing of the envelope, which is a metaphor that is so apt for writers, of course, and in general, is where it's at. The, um, the fact that I had tragedy in my life early, two things that were very, very difficult, the loss of my brother and my expatriation, my defection from communism, but essentially my defection from the home that I knew so well, from the language that I liked so much, and from fans that I loved as much as they loved me. Those were extremely debilitating, extremely traumatizing. I, I had the feeling that I, I had come out after that I swam, went to the bottom, came out gasping for air, and finding that I was in a different lake, in a different sea, with different shores, with different uh, ships around myself in a completely different world. And I was barely gasping back to life. I could, have, I could have died. No, I was awake again. And the challenge of the new started in the next 10 minutes. If you have that kind of karma for whatever reason, I, I, I think that it's actually a kind of metaphor of Romania's fate through history because Romania had seemed to disappear completely and then reappeared with incredible vigor a good number of times. If you have that kind of karma, you will do something, you will make something of yourself, you will invent a formula, 
you will, in one way or the other, impress on the environment the fact that you exist. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I've done. But I'm also living in a time when international writers are not that few anymore. It is a measure of the times that we lived, of the good fact of the time that we lived, that we have this dialogue in, in English, yourself and me, and we uh, send it out to whoever speaks English, including Romanian Americans of various languages that live here or somewhere else in the world. In other words, the world has finally begun to mix together. And definitely a character like myself benefits from that. The writers that are, and they exist, they are sort of born to be classics. It's not, there is nothing wrong with that kind. There's literature that needs to be majestic, sacred, mysterious, and an unattainable, um, an unattainable peak for anyone but the one who writes it. Writers like that exist all over the world. I'm not one of them. And I think that the interesting thing is that sometimes writers of my type survive better, age better, because their own capacity as people, as individuals, to catch on with the change around them participates a lot in the creative process. Do, do, you, do, you, do you sense when a story uh, will be, uh, or if a story will be successful, if, um, if, uh, if a character will make uh, a big impact? I mean, looking at the, the, um, uh, the stories that you, um, you have written uh, throughout this, uh, these years, I mean, you, uh, you wrote, of course, about, uh, about Amazon, but you also wrote about the Holocaust. Uh, you wrote about the Virgin Mary before, uh, uh, before, um, before the birth of her famous son. Th that's right, uh, and uh, and also about um, about life in um, in uh, post-communist uh, societies and uh, and uh, uh, all this um, this variety of. Uh, of topics um, and of places um, and characters. Do you know when you are writing? They have been hugely successful, and that's that's the that's the point. Uh, do you know when they, you write them, or when you think of them, or when you put together a book, start to think of the story, and then write it and create a, uh, develop the characters? Do you know? Well, okay, it's going to be successful. Now I think it's this is one. This is the one. This is this is the one. This is going to be successful. Do you do you have this sense? Intuition. When I was young, it was pure intuition. I said to myself, I feel that this particular uh, set of circumstances, which is usually uh, presented, especially in fiction, in the first three to five pages. I mean, in, in a famous book by uh, Saramago, people go blind in the first five to 10 pages of the book. It's the book called Blindness. And uh, after that, everything is consequence. I knew that if the beginning presents a shock, a shock that is not cheap, you know, there's not something that is, um, that appeals to prurience. We are all voyeurs. Yes, we are. I am one of them. But the point of view should be, if this were to happen to you, my reader, or if it were to happen to me, the writer, and I would impart it with you, my reader, what kind of changes would happen in our psyche and perhaps even in, our, um, in the precarious conditions of our very life for the next few years or whatever? I, uh, that was, like I said, by instinct. This seems hard enough. This seems strong enough. This mm -hmm. seems novel enough. But then I started to realize that there is a certain type of, there is a kind of mechanics to it. The fact is, is that if you take any individual and you confront him with something that he's not used to, that he takes him off of his normal persona, 
his normal image, his routine reactions, his daily uh, understandings and um, actions, which are usually small, modest, the result of long periods of time of preparation and all of that. Life is in fact, every day, a huge commute of some kind. We we'll all start the day in bed, we get down to our cars or the cars of our minds. Not anymore now with the self-isolation. Now we start from the bed and go to the telephone and go to the Zoom. Right. We're right. happy that they exist. But if you start at that point and then you introduce a totally unexpected change, sometimes it is exterior, sometimes it is inner, it's of the psyche, it's of memory, it's of something that has germinated inside all of a sudden forces that the hero uh, to act differently. Then you have it, but then you have to serve it, in my opinion, with a lot of, I don't like the word honesty about art because I don't think art is honest in the straight way. Mm -hmm. I think art is honest in what it creates in people. Then you start, if you went to an incredible, um, art show and saw some stuff on the walls, hanging on the walls, that is so, it is so fertilizing for your own psyche, then indeed you are closer to the most honest uh, evaluation of yourself. But art as such, as I said, it is not honest in the first, in its first offering. It is honest in the second, in the third, and- uh, It's all technique, it's mastery, it's no- yeah, Exactly. So all of a sudden, I recognized that in Eastern Europe, especially, literature was very realistic, narrowly realistic, and that it, there was an element that it missed, invention. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the trip to, an to a land exotic in one way or another, through its uh, political system, through its incredible geographical uh, isolation through nature, through um, breeds of people that are different than we are. The exiting your own habitat, that in Eastern European literature is rare. And in fact, one of the most accomplished Eastern Europeans um, who did it was one of my, uh, uh, one of the writers I respect most, the Pole Joseph Conrad, who did not he, at least I wrote in Romanian eight or nine books, and they are, they are separated in two stages. One of them is what I wrote before I expatriated myself. And a few years ago, I wrote uh, a, again a book in Romanian, and I had the most wonderful time in the world. It was like I was seeing again a woman that I had loved as a young man, and I found her as young and good looking, <laughs> I'm, re I'm referring to the Romanian language. And that being said, uh, Joseph Conrad was an incredible, a titan of international writing. His, several of his uh, great books have been um, dramatized uh, on the stage and in the movies. And until the end of his life, he was this strange character of British literary world who was speaking all the time with a Polish accent and occasionally missing out on words that the others had absolutely no, um, no they, were, they, they knew what they were saying all the time. Conrad, like myself to a certain extent, still translated from the Polish to the English. And uh, it is a condition that I think keeps you young. But um, I, um, because you, uh, you talked about <clears throat> seeing all these places, I, I want to um, uh, uh, go to a different um, to a different topic, and that's uh, that's traveling journeys. Uh, you have been a passionate traveler. Some of your books, I mean, most of your books are taking place in various uh, various places in the world. In um, in, uh, of course, in the Amazon, in Africa, in uh, in, uh, in Judea and Christian times, Christian times. That's right. And uh, but you have traveled. You have traveled extensively. There is like um, like a hunger for geography, for space. Um, 
what, what, what did uh, traveling uh, teach you? What, what did you find in, in this tra traveling? It was only entertainment, it was, I don't know, uh, discoveries about places or about yourself, it was a philosophical experience. It was, what, what was that? Why, why do you travel? Well, first of all, and naively somewhat, I thought to myself, I go in some other geographies on some other latitudes, I will find some great stories. One time I did, that was Amazon Beaming and Lauren McIntyre, who was a towering explorer, was himself a very pusillanimous writer. And he said, you know, I don't dare write my, my life, but I would let you write it if I tell you of it. So he, he told um, his life story to a Romanian uh, who had not written in English um, more than six years at the time that we met. And we got along enormously. He was a very similar man from that point of view. He wanted to see the planet, to see the world, to understand it from within and those various places. What you discover usually is not that other people are different, but that other people are similar. I discovered 20 Romanians in various parts of the world with exactly a geopolitical situation like Romania in the armpit of a great empire, as Romania has been since the Romans, starting with the Romans and finishing with the Soviets. I saw countries that had rural um, cultures of great sophistication. I mean, the people that spoke them, danced them, uh, sculpted them, whatever, they were not schooled and didn't matter. Those cultures were, were living, they were robust. Um, there was a great interest in progress in all of those places, even though that progress was inaccessible many times to those people themselves. And I discovered to my, uh, to my, um, I discovered to my satisfaction that America is not a hated nation as we are. Um, we, there is a certain interesting parallel propaganda between governments that have their various competitions with America and therefore they describe America as an unpleasant giant, but not the Americans themselves. In other words, I have to say that being a Romanian American is a pleasant condition in the world. People are interested in you. People are interested in your former country. People are interested in your present country. The other thing is, I believe a lot that um, America's lack of history, as some people say, is a great blessing. In other words, the chains of self-respect are light. People can shake them easily in this country. People come to this country from the other ends of the world. Some of them um, achieve successes as spectacular as Elon Musk. Others become artists completely at home among people. Well -known writers, I would say, right? <laughs> Others well-known writers and screenwriters. Well, I don't know um, if, if our issue is how many Romanians uh, transplanted themselves successfully, I'll say very many, but not in writing only. I will say that right now there is a great current in the whole world for young people, young men and women from other countries to come and conquer, not academia and certainly not the Nobel Prize for writing, but Hollywood. Hollywood is far more a center of attention and a place of ambition than, than the, and the writers by nature have to be solitary. So well, what does it take to, to, to succeed in Hollywood? It's luck, it's guts, it's hard work, it's because you, you know it, because you've been- To a great extent, luck. And I'll give you an example. Writers walk into dinner parties in Hollywood, and if they sit next to a producer, they can fascinate the producer in that evening more than if they had waited for the lottery of being read by the producer. Incidentally, producers don't read a lot. They don't have the time. They make deals. They have people who read for them, which is not a good way to know what exactly, what was in the, the, this book that interested you for a second. And that is the, the operation of Hollywood is this, um, 
cultural medium that destructures and restructures itself all, all the time. There are an incredible number of adventurers and operators, some of them actually very smart. In other words, good instinct of the audience, not necessarily good instinct of what makes a good uh, source material for film. Writers in understand that relationship. If they're capable to leave some of the comforts of being complete masters over the book or the screenplay or the essay or whatever it is, because as a writer, you're the, the sole author. Even though I owe an enormous, an enormous debt of uh, co-work to my wife, who is a screenplay writer as well, and who is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met when it comes to understanding me <laughs> and <laughs> to <laughs> discovering what makes me operate. And the, this last novel that I just finished, The Parachutist, is a book that I wrote by myself, but on a storyline that we often co-worked out together. And I asked her, I said, I, I would like to, to write in the, uh, in the forward. I would like to write that, in fact, at least, we fashion the story together. And, and, and she said very simply, don't do it. I said, why? Because uh, you confuse the reader as to how much of yourself is in this. And in this book, you have to be there 100%. So I have the, the, the incredible- is, to, uh, is the book about to come out soon? Is it- uh... The book has been finished. It hasn't been sold yet. I am so filled with the, a uh, pleasure of saying it is finished at last. Remember, the, the first 100 pages was written almost 25 years ago. That is a rare thing in my writing. In my writing in general, I catch the tiger and then I seclude myself into a, into a cage with the tiger and try to see if I will survive or the tiger will survive. That's it. And that battle starts and ends with one of the animals still alive. So my way to work is I work on what is in my, in my heart at that time, the strongest call. It happened a number of times that I started, but very few. And generally the things that I had started and I wanted to finish later, I never completed. This one, the parachutist has too many issues that uh, I think are important for us today. It even has metaphorically something about the pandemic, but I don't want to, to reveal too much about it. Some of the characters are historic characters. It was a book, it was very much fun to write it once I had all the, um, all the research ready, but the assembling of the research, it was a pain. It was an incredible ordeal. So, who knows, maybe I'll write after this just to, to rest my, my mind. Maybe I'll write something like, <laughs> like, like some commercial thriller <laughs> or something like that and never publish it. But we are looking, we are looking forward to this, uh, to this uh, new book. Uh, let's hope it's going to be a, a smashing hit like, uh, like uh, many others. Uh, let's, hope it gets, let's hope it gets sold and published because after that, Books receive usually the, not always, but mostly they receive the treatment that they deserve. If a, if a book is good, even if it doesn't break numbers, it brings you the type of readers who when they write to you and when you meet them, you know you've been understood. That's fantastic. That is what we live for. Um, again, about your life, um, you have um, you, you left uh, Romania when you were in you know on, on the peak of your uh, success, literary success, social success, and then you reinvented yourself in uh, in the UK and mostly in in the United States. Uh, then you you traveled all over the world in some dangerous places for your research because all your books are very uh, very carefully uh, carefully researched. Do you like thank, taking risks? How how do you? How I, do you I don't like taking risks. Number one. Uh, secondly, I have suffered from anxiety, sometimes of the simplest kind, 
will this elevator all of a sudden stop between two floors? And I'll be stuck here, especially if I don't have my, my telephone with me. And others that are far more elaborate, but they're about health and all of that and whatever. Thank God they are short-lived. I have put together a mechanism to tell myself, don't be silly. Uh, way back when I was 13, 14, 15, but I am generally an individual who is aware of what is dangerous. I am aware either both in situations and in personal relationships. I, I signal pretty well to myself when someone's ego or my own starts creating a crisis between myself and other people, sometimes deeply loved people. But uh, if daring is defying anxiety, then I am daring. If daring is a sort of stoic uh, um, quality that, uh, that makes us good soldiers, so to speak, that one I don't have. And I'm, like I said, I'm from a family that was wrong and whatever, it had all sorts of professions in it, including writers. I had several uncles who fought in World War II. I was very fascinated with the fact that they had fought and they had not behaved like cowards. And I said, how did you do it? He said, you talk to yourself. In other words, the same mechanism. You have to be in touch with yourself and to be sincere about what at that, which part of yourself needs help then. And you have to give it to yourself. Uh, that, was, that, was a, um, that was a discovery that I made when I was quarantined during that other pandemic of my life, the polio epidemic in Romania. It's that far back. Yeah, it's, uh, it's far back and there's uh, so many similarities to a, to a certain extent to what we are living uh, now. Of course, that was uh, probably much more dangerous. Uh, we started our conversation talking about transitions, transitions from novel to screenwriting, transitions from a, a communist society to uh, a Western society, from literature to film and so on. But I've noticed another transition uh, looking at your uh, books. Uh, your first books in Romania um, um, projected this persona, you know, as the main character, this persona was a vital person, a polyglot, somebody uh, growing up in the cities, young, uh, uh, powerful, um, with, a, with a thirst for, extraordinary thirst for, for life. And of course, a lot, a lot of young people at the time identified with this uh, character that was so yeah. vital. A whole the generation was like that. Yeah, and this, uh, that's right, because it was an essential situation in the life of that generation. Vital, educated, wanted to do something with their life, and still something was there, you know, uh, uh, arresting this, this development, frustrating this growth. And later, when you look at your books, um, the themes shift to something uh, different. You see a lot, uh, um, a miraculous life, uh, uh, an interest for the magic, uh, uh, a magic of life. How do you see this uh, transition from the vitality of existence to the magic uh, of life? Um, is, is there something, something profound that has uh, has uh, brought about this, uh, this change? Definitely, there is something, I don't know how profound it is. In other words, it's all encompassing. Uh, there are two things and uh, we can describe them in absolutely um, trivial terms, aging and marriage. In other words, <laughs> you get older, you certainly gradually, no longer so in love with yourself and so vain and so confident and so full of cockiness. I was all those things. I am fewer than just <laughs> all that I said, even though I, I am, I take uh, uh, satisfaction in the fact that I am active at my age and I'm active without any kind of forcing myself. I hope that that kind of inner youth, which most people have, some, someone has to be very beaten, very depressed 
from circumstances to lose that quality. That's the quality of Cocteau, I think, said that how, what, how terrible and what a bore to be a young soul in an old body. <laughs> so, aging, unfortunately, cannot be kept at bay, though it's good to know how to remember your own youth and to transpose that. The other thing, marriage, which is an institution that one doesn't write enough about, maybe I'll have the time to write about marriage towards the end of my life so that I see that I have the sum of the discoveries. The only way to, the only way to continue the human breed, it was discovered was to pair it between a male and a female, sometimes between a male and several females or several female, uh, males and one female. But in the main, the model is the male stripped down to one individual, the female stripped down to one individual. You do, and people say, I do for love what I never thought I would be doing. You do for marriage what you never thought you'd be doing. You accept situations, you recognize your own weaknesses and mistakes, you suffer from guilt and regret. And uh, um, if you want to continue that relationship, the one that I think is basic to your nature, there's only one individual who fits that bill completely. And I think it's usually the woman that you end your life with. Now, the, 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 you, you start your life with many people. So those, of course, bring a lot of reflection. The reflection sometimes is nostalgic. Oh God, was I young at the time? I mean, how many people, billions of people on this planet have at least one time looked at an old photograph of themselves. And the first thing, and perhaps the only thing that, that exudes from the photograph is the youth of back then. Was I young? People don't, don't say, hey, I was looking a suit that cost me, I don't know how much money or whatever. Look at my hair. I used to wear it that way because I had more of it back then. And no, the spontaneous, spontaneous reaction is, look how young I was to yourself. So when, when you age gracefully, so to speak, um, your youth doesn't leave completely. You are like a good looking man or good looking woman whom you, you meet them at some time accidentally and say, this must have been a greatly handsome guy or girl in their prime. The youth remains. You can, you can see it, you can read it. Very often people shed decades when they start becoming, being animated or uh, they're interested in something, when they laugh, when they have. So let's hope that we resolve the issue of the vaccine. We will have, a, an in, I think there will be a moment of several months at least of great rejuvenation for the planet. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this talk. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, immensely, but I'm afraid that our time is running. I mean, I'm really, I must confess that I could only <laughs> ask half of the questions that I, uh, I have prepared. Uh, but um, definitely we must, um, we must resume our conversation when the vaccine is, uh, is out so that you can uh, start uh, traveling and we will be very, very proud to, uh, to receive you here in, uh, in New York. I, in I am very honored to be received when the parachute is, is published. And uh, um, aside from that, I, uh, I, if you have sometimes panels with four or five other people and you discuss an issue that's interesting, either for all of us or for just us Romanians. Please have me then as well. I would be very interested to be part of. I we will be we will be very uh, very happy to to have you uh, again. We are of course uh, uh, doing a lot a lot of things, and I'm sure we will find the right uh, context to uh, uh, to invite you. But definitely, a promise uh, is made that uh, when the parachute is is um, out, or we will rush to organize, um, uh, with Dr. Fauci's permission, a uh, book launching uh, a book launching event here in, uh, in, in New York. 
um, uh, thank you again for being uh, uh, for being with us uh, in uh, in this program. I'd like very much that we end our uh, conversation for the moment uh, with this celebration of uh, of youth, of uh, being young, of being vital, of um, staying young de des despite of um, of the uh, ap appearances. Uh, it's very, very, uh, very, very appropriate to uh, end of, of, uh, on this note. Um, I'd like to thank you all for um, uh, showing so much interest in everything we do here at the Romanian Cultural Institute. Uh, you can learn more about our um, five, six series. Uh, practically every day we have a premiere of um, online uh, original and exclusive content from Monday to, uh, uh, to Saturday. There are things that are cooking and we will be soon uh, launch new series, hopefully so, uh, equally, uh, equally interesting. And we are very grateful for your kind words and the words of appreciation with what we are doing, what we have done. We are also uh, very uh, heartened by the fact that everything we have done and we are doing is dedicated to the um, men and women on the first line on the fight against uh, uh, against the pandemic, especially Romanian American and uh, uh, Romanian Canadian um, medical um, personnel and essential uh, essential uh, workers. So continue to uh, follow us, follow us on all uh, platforms. Uh, visit the rciusa.info uh, website. Uh, this conversation uh, will be available on our website. So if uh, you missed it or some of your friends missed it, uh, you have the chance to, uh, to see it. It's I want my family to, um, to be the first to see it because generally when we go to Romania and there is a public occasion in which people come and ask me questions or whatever, uh, it happens in Romanian. And since my wife is American, and as all Americans, speaks English excellently well, and my children speak English excellently well, <laughs> but when it comes to Romania, I have to translate. <laughs> so not in this case. Thank you again for being, um, being uh, with us. We will be seeing again when the, uh, when the vaccine is out, when the pandemic uh, ends. Uh, all of you watching in North America, in Europe, in Romania, everywhere in the world, uh, stay safe and uh, stay connected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.